Hercules by Kate Stevens Many, many years ago, in the far-off land of Hellas, which we call Greece, lived a happy young couple whose names were Alcmene and Amphitryon. Now Amphitryon, the husband, owned many herds of cattle. So also the father of Alcmene, who was king of Mycenae, owned many. All these cattle, grazing together and watering at the same springs, became united in one herd, and this was the cause of much trouble. For Amphitryon fell to quarreling with the father of his wife about his portion of the herd. At last he slew his father-in-law, and from that day he fled his old home at Mycenae. Alcmene went with her husband, and the young couple settled at Thebes, where were born to them two boys, twins, which were later named Hercules and Iphicles. From the child's very birth, Zeus, the king of all heaven, that is, the air and clouds, and the father of gods and men, from the boy's very birth, Zeus loved Hercules. But when Hera, wife of Zeus, who shared his honors, saw this love, she was angry. Especially she was angry because Zeus foretold that Hercules should become the greatest of men. Therefore, one night, when the two babies were but eight months old, Hera sent two huge serpents to destroy them. The children were asleep in the great shield of brass which Amphitryon carried in battle for his defense. It was a good bed, for it was round and curved toward the center, and filled with soft blankets which Alcmene and the maids of the house had woven at their looms. Forward toward the shield the huge snakes were creeping and just as they lifted their open mouths above the rim and were making ready to seize them, the twins opened their eyes. Iphicles screamed with fright. His cries wakened their mother, Alcmene, who called in a loud voice for help. But before Amphitryon and the men of the household could draw their swords and rush to the rescue, the baby Hercules, sitting up in the shield, unterrified, and seizing a serpent in each hand, had choked and strangled them till they died. From his early years, Hercules was instructed in the learning of his time. Castor, the most experienced charioteer of his day, taught him. Eurytus also, how to shoot with a bow and arrows. Linus, how to play upon the lyre. And Eumolpus, grandson of the North Wind, drilled him in singing. Thus time passed to his eighteenth year, when so great already had become his strength and knowledge, he killed a fierce lion which had preyed upon the flocks of Amphitryon while they were grazing on Mount Cithiron, and which had in fact laid waste many a fat farm of the surrounding country. But the anger of Hera still followed Hercules, and the goddess sent upon him a madness. In this craze the hero did many unhappy deeds. For punishment and an expiation, he condemned himself to exile, and at last he went to the great shrine of the god Apollo at Delphi to ask whither he should go and were settled. The Pythia, or priestess in the temple, desired him to settle at Tiryns to serve as bondsman to Eurystheus, who ruled at Mycenae as king, and to perform the great labors which Eurystheus should impose upon him. When these tasks were all accomplished, the inspired priestess added, Hercules should be numbered among the immortal gods. The First Labor Wrestling with the Nemean Lion The first task which Eurystheus required of Hercules was to bring him the skin of a lion which no arrow nor other weapon could wound and which had long been a terror to the good people who lived in Nemea. Hercules set forth, armed with bow and quiver, but paused in the outer wood of Nemea long enough to cut himself his famous club. There, too, he fell in with an honest countryman who pledged him to make a sacrifice to Zeus the Savior if he, Hercules, should return victorious. 
but if he was slain by the monstrous lion, then the countryman should make the sacrifice a funeral offering to himself as a hero. So Hercules proceeded far into a dense wood, deserted because all people feared the fierce beast it protected. On he went till after many days he sighted the lion at rest near the cave which was its den. Standing behind a tree of great girth, Hercules fitted and let fly an arrow. It struck and glanced, leaving the animal unharmed. Then he tried another shot, aiming at the heart. Again the arrow failed, but the lion was by this time roused, and his eyes shot fiery glances, and the heavy roar from his throat made the woods most horribly resound. Then the devoted Hercules seized his heavy wooden club, and rushing forward drove the lion by the suddenness and fierceness of his assault into his den. But the den had two entrances. Against one, Hercules rolled huge stones, and entering the cave by the other, he grasped the lion's throat with both hands, and thus held him struggling and gasping for breath till he lay at his feet dead. Hercules swung the mighty bulk upon his shoulders and proceeded to seek the countrymen with whom his pledge stood. So great had been his journey, and so hard his search, that he did not find the good man till the last of the thirty days. There he stood just on the point of offering a sheep to Hercules, supposing him dead. Together they sacrificed the sheep to Zeus instead, and Hercules, vigorous and victorious, bore the mighty lion's body to Eurystheus at Mycenae. Entering the place, and throwing the carcass down before the king, Hercules so terrified Eurystheus by this token of his wonderful strength, that the king forbade him ever again to enter the city. Indeed, some say that the terror of Eurystheus was so great that he had a jar or vessel of brass secretly constructed underground which he might use as a safe retreat in case of danger. This jar was probably a chamber and its walls covered within with plates of brass. For now in our own day is seen there at Mycenae a room under the earth, and the nails which fastened the brass plates to the wall still remain. Ever after the conquest of this lion, Hercules clothed himself with the skin. The Second Labor Destroying the Lernian Hydra The second task of Hercules was to destroy a hydra, or water snake, which dwelt in the marsh of Lerna, a small lake near Mycenae. The body of this snake was large, and from its body sprang nine heads. Eight of these heads were mortal, but the ninth head was undying. Hercules stepped into his chariot, and his dear nephew Iolaus, who was permitted by the Delphic priestess to drive for him, took up the reins. The way to learn it was pleasant. In springtime crocuses and hyacinths sprang by the roadside, and in early summer the nightingales sang in the olive groves, vineyard, and forest that so great and horrible a monster could be near. When Hercules and Iolaus came to Lerna, they drew close to ground, rising near a spring. And Hercules, dismounting and searching, found the very hole into which the hydra had retired. Into this he shot fiery arrows. The arrows discomforting the snake, it crawled forth, and, darting at him furiously, endeavored to twine itself about his legs. The hero began then to wield his mighty club. He crushed head after head upon the snake's body, but for every one crushed, two sprang in its place. At length the hydra had coiled so firmly round one leg that Hercules could not move an inch from the spot. And now an enormous crab came from the water out of friendship for the hydra, and that too crept up to Hercules, and seizing his foot painfully wounded him. Swinging his club with heroic vigor, Hercules beat the crab to death. Then he called to Iolaus to fire a little grove of trees nearby. 
Iolaus at once set the fire, and when the saplings were well aflame, he seized them, and standing by the hero, as fast as Hercules cut off a head of the hydra, he seared the neck with a flaming brand. The searing prevented the heads from growing again. When all the eight mortal heads had thus been dispatched, Hercules struck off the one said to be immortal and buried it in the roadway, setting a heavy stone above. The body of the hydra he cut up and dipped his arrows in the gall, which was so full of poison that the least scratch from such an arrow would bring certain death. Eurystheus received the news of the destruction of the water snake with bad grace. He claimed that Hercules had not destroyed the monster alone, but only with the assistance of Iolaus. All the people, however, rejoiced greatly, and they hastened to drain the marsh where the hydra had dwelt so that never again could such an enemy abide upon their lands. The Third Labor Capturing the Arcadian Hind in the days in which Hercules lived, Arcadia was a beautiful country of cool, sweet-scented woods, clear mountain streams, and sloping meadowsides, from which rose every now and then the roof of a hunter's cottage or a shepherd's hutch. It was a country also peculiarly pleasing to Artemis, the god of the chase, and peculiarly also it was the haunt of all animals especially dear to the goddess. A hind was there of such loveliness and grace that Artemis had marked her for her own, and given her a pair of golden horns so that she might be known from all other deer, and her life thus preserved. For no good Helen or Greek would slay for food any animal sacred to a god. This beautiful golden-horned hind Eurystheus ordered Hercules to bring to him alive, for the irreverence of the king did not go so far as to demand her dead. So Hercules went forth for the hunting, and, not wishing to wound the hind, pursued her for one entire year. Up hill he went, down many a mountain dale, across many a gleaming river, through deep forest and open field, and always dancing before him were the golden tips of horns of the hind, near enough to be seen, too far to be seized. At last, tired with the pursuit of the lovely beast, one day took refuge upon the mountainside, and there, as she sought the water of a river, Hercules struck her with an arrow. The wound was slight, but it helped the hero to catch the creature and to lift her to his shoulders. Thereupon he started for the court of Eurystheus. But the way was long, and it lay through a part of Arcadia where the bush was heavy, and forests were deep, and mountains were high. And while Hercules was pursuing his way and bearing his meek-eyed burden, he one day met the fair goddess to whom the hind was sacred. Her brother, the beautiful god Apollo, was with her. Artemis, seeing her captured deer, cried to the hero, Mortal, oho! Thus wilt thou violate a creature set aside by the gods? Mighty Artemis and Huntress, answered Hercules, This hind I know is thine. A twelve month have I chased and at last caught her, but the god necessity forced me. O oh, immortal one, I am not impious. Eurystheus commanded me to catch the hind, and the priestess of Apollo enjoined me to observe the king's command. When Artemis understood how Hercules was bondman, she dismissed her anger and sent him forward with kind words. And thus he brought the golden-horned hind to Mycenae and sent it in to the king. The Fourth Labor Capturing the Boar of Erymanthus In the northwestern part of the famed Arcadia, where the golden-horned hind roamed, was a range of mountains called Erymanthus. Over the high tops of this range wandered also a wild beast. But unlike the lovely hind, he was fierce and terrible of aspect and deadly in encounter. He was known as 
the boar of Arimanthus. This tusked and terrible being, the king of Mycenae, Eurystheus, commanded the mighty Hercules, his bondman, to bring alive to him. Again Hercules set out, and again he fared over hill and across bright waters. And as he went, the birds sang spring songs to him from vine and tree shade, and yellow crocuses carpeted the earth. In his journey he came one day to the home of Pholus, a centaur who dwelt with other centaurs upon the side of a mountain. Now the centaurs were, of all the dwellers of that distant land, most unlike us modern folks. For report has it that they were half that noble creature, man, and half that noble creature, horse. That is to say, they were men, as far as the waist. And then came the body of the horse with its swift four feet. There are those, indeed, who claim that the centaurs were men and rode their mountain ponies so deftly that man and horse seemed one whole creature. Be that as it may, upon this mountain side the centaur Pholus dwelt with others of his kind, and there to visit with him came Hercules. The centaur, with his hospitable heart and own hands, prepared a dinner of roast meat for the hungry traveler, and as they sat at the board in genial converse, they had much enjoyment. But Hercules was also thirsty, and the sparkling water from the mountain spring seemed not to satisfy him. He asked the centaur for wine. Ah, wine, my guest friend Hercules, answered Pholus. I have none of my own. Yonder is a jar of old vintage, but it belongs to all the centaurs of our mountain, and I cannot open it. But friend Pholus, said Hercules pressingly, I would I had a little for my stomach's sake. Now the centaur had a kind heart, as we have said, and he rejoiced that Hercules had come. And to give the hero his desires, he opened the jar. The wine was made from grapes that grew under the fair skies of Arcadia, and its fragrance was like a scent of lilies or of roses. And when the soft winds entered the door near which Hercules sat drinking, it seized the perfume and bore it over the mountainside. Now, here of all the mischief a little wine may make. The fragrance in the air told the centaurs, wherever each happened to be, that their wine jar had been opened, and they rushed to its resting place, perhaps to defend it from any wayfaring thief, perhaps to help drink it, we do not know. But each came angrily to the mouth of the cave of Pholus, and all were armed with stones and staves which they had seized as they hastened onward. When they first entered with raging cries and threatening gesture, Hercules grasped the brands burning on the hospitable hearth and drove them back. As others pressed behind them, the hero drew forth his arrows, poisoned with the gall of the Lernian Hydra, and sent among them many a shaft. Thus they fought, retreating, and they, fleeing and Hercules pursuing, came finally to the dwelling of Chiron, most famed of all the centaurs, and a teacher of Hercules in his youth, teacher of his great art of surgery. The wine raging in the veins of Hercules made him for the moment forgetful of all the good Chiron had bestowed upon him, and still letting fly his poisonous arrows, he, aiming at another, hit the noblest of the centaurs. Grief seized Hercules when he saw what he had done, and he ran and drew out the arrow and applied a soft ointment which Chiron himself had taught him to make, but it was in vain. For the centaur, inspiring teacher, and famed for his love of justice as he was, soon gave up the ghost. Saddened at his own madness,
Hercules now returned to the cave of his guest friend Pholus. There, among others, his host lay, and stark dead. He had drawn an arrow from the body of one who had died from its wound, and, while examining it and wondering how so slight a shaft could be so fatal, had accidentally dropped it out of his hand. It struck his foot, and he expired that very moment. Hercules paid all funeral honor to his friends, and afterward, departing from the unhappy neighborhood, took up his search of the boar. Heavy snows were lying on the crests of Eurymanthus when Hercules came upon the tracks of the wild creature, and following patiently, finally reached his lair. There the boar stood, his tusks pointed outward, ready for attack, his eyes snapping vindictively. He was indeed a terrible thing to see. Hercules, instead of shooting at the animal, began to call, and shouting with loud cries, he so confused the boar that he ran into the vast snowdrift standing nearby. Thereupon the hero seized and bound him with a wild grapevine he had brought for the purpose, and so, swinging him over his shoulder, he took his way toward Mycenae. The king Eurystheus was terribly frightened at the very prospect of having the boar to keep, and when he heard Hercules was coming to town with the animal on his shoulders, he took to the brazen underground chamber which he had built when Hercules came in with the body of the Nemean lion. There he stayed for several days, according to a good old historian, Diodorus, who, in writing of the king, told that he was so great a coward. The Sixth Labor Shooting the Stymphalian Birds Far in the famed land of Arcadia is a beautiful lake known so many years ago, as in the time of Hercules, and even by us in our day as Lake Stymphalus. It is a lake of pure sweet water, and it lies, as such waters lie in our own country, high up in mountains and amid hillsides covered with firs and poplars and clinging vines and wild blossoms. In our day the lake is a resort for gentle singing birds, but in the time of Hercules other birds were there also. The other birds were waterfowls, and they had gathered at Lake Stymphalus because they had been driven out of their old home by wolves, who alone were hungrier and more destructive than they. These fowls had claws of iron, and every feather of theirs was sharper than a barbed arrow, and so strong and fierce and ravenous they were that they would dart from the air and attack hunters, yea, and pecking them down would tear and strip their flesh till but a bony skeleton remained of that which a few minutes before had been a strong, active, buoyant man seeking in the chase for food for his hearthside. To make way with this horrid tribe of the air was the sixth command Eurystheus laid upon Hercules. Toward Lake Stymphalus, therefore, turned our hero. Again he walked Arcadian waysides, and again, as he fared, the spring sun shone above, and the birds sang welcome and the narcissus lifted its golden cup, and as he went his heart rejoiced in his life, whatever the difficulty of his labor and in the beauty of the world before his eyes. And as he walked he also thought of how he should accomplish the great undertaking upon which he was bent. While thus deliberating, the great-eyed goddess of wisdom, Athena, came to him, just as this goddess, even in our day, come to those who think, and she suggested to his mind that he should scare the fowl from their retreat by brazen rattles. The goddess did even more than put the notion of using a rattle in the mind of Hercules. It is said she actually brought him one, a huge bronze clapper, made for him by the forger of the gods limping Hephaestus. 
Hercules took this rattle, and mounting a neighboring height, shook it in his great hands till every hill echoed and the very trees quivered with the horrid sound. And the man-eating birds? Not one remained hidden. Each and every one rose terrified in the air, croaking and working its steely talons and sharp-pointed feathers in dire fear. Now from his quiver the hero fast picked his barbed arrows, and fast he shot, and every shot brought to his feet one of the terrible man-eaters, till at last he had slain every one. Now from his quiver the hero fast picked his barbed arrows, and fast he shot, and every shot brought to his feet one of the terrible man-eaters, till at last he had slain every one, or if indeed any of the tribe had escaped, they had flown far away, for never after in all the long history of Lake Stamphalus have such creatures appeared again above its fair waters. So ended the sixth labor of Hercules. The seventh labor, capturing the Cretan bull. Just as Zeus, who, as we said in the beginning, was king of all heaven, that is, the air and clouds, so Poseidon was king of the sea. With his queen Amphitrite he lived far down underneath the waves, and dwelt in a palace splendid with all the beautiful things of the deep. In the midst of the blue waters of the Mediterranean, where Poseidon had his home, lies an island called Crete. And long ago, in the days when Hercules labored, a king, whose name was Minos, ruled over this land. The island is long and narrow and has much sea coast, and because of this fact King Minos stood in intimate relations with the god of the sea. Now, one day, in an especial burst of friendliness, Minos vowed to sacrifice to Poseidon whatever should come out of the salt waters. The god, in pleasure at the vow, and, to test mayhap the devotion of Minos, sent at once a beautiful bull leaping and swimming through the waves. When the creature had come to the rocky coast and made land, its side shone with such beauty and its ivory white horns garlanded with lilies set so like a crown above its graceful head that Minos and all the people who saw it marveled that anywhere could have grown such a bull. And a sort of greed and deceit seized Minos as he gazed, and for his sacrifice to Poseidon he resolved to use another bull, and so he ordered his herdsmen to take this fair creature that had come from the sea and to put it among his herd, and also to bring forth another for the offering. Because of this avarice of Minos, the god below the waves was angry, and he made the bull wild and furious, so that no herdsman dared approach to feed or care for it. For his seventh task, Eurystheus commanded Hercules to fetch him this mad bull of Crete. Hercules, accordingly, boarded one of the ships that plied in that far-off day, as well as in this time of ours, between the rocky coast of Crete and the fair land of Hellas, and in due time, the hero came to Minos's court. I have come, sire, said Hercules, for the mad bull that terrifies thy herdsmen and is rumored beyond capture. Ah, young man, cried the king, thou hast come for my bull, and my bull shalt thou have. When thou hast taken it, it is thine. And the king laughed grimly, for the strength and fury of the creature he deemed beyond any man's control. Hercules sought the grove where Poseidon's gift had strayed from its fellows, 
and there, deftly seizing it by the horns, he bound its feet with stout straps of bull's hide, and its horns he padded with moss of the sea from which it came. And so having made it powerless, he lifted it to his shoulders and carried it to the shore. A swift black ship was just spreading sail from Crete, and entering upon it, the hero soon ended his journey and laid his capture before Eurystheus. A day or two later, Hercules loosed the bull, which after wandering through the woodlands of Arcadia, crossed the Isthmus and came to the plains of Marathon, whence, after doing much damage, it swam off to sea and was never heard of after. So far we have told how Hercules accomplished seven of the tasks laid upon him. Space does not permit us to recount in detail the other five. The eighth task was to bring to Eurystheus the man-eating mares of the king of Windy Thrace. The ninth task was to fetch a girdle which Ares, god of war, had given the queen of the Amazons, an exceedingly difficult labor, for the Amazons were a nation of women warriors renowned for valor. For the tenth task, Eurystheus demanded the purple oxen of a famous giant who dwelt on an island far out in the ocean. The eleventh task was to bring apples from the garden of the Hesperides, golden apples, guarded by a dragon with a hundred heads, no one of which ever closed its eyes in sleep. And the twelfth and last task which was to free the mighty Hercules from his bondage to cowardly Eurystheus, was to fetch Cerberus, the three-headed dog who guarded the entrance to Hades, the unseen abode of departed spirits. Each and every one of these labors the strong hero accomplished. Having won his freedom and gained the honors promised by the priestess at Delphi many years before, Hercules worked many a noble deed, and finally, in reward for his much enduring and his aid to mortals, he was carried upon a thunder cloud to the upper air and entered into the very gates of heaven. <laughs>